Do you suffer from the debilitating symptoms of chronic pain, swelling, and loss of joint motion due to arthritis? Are you taking drugs like Celebrex and Vioxx or other super aspirin prescriptions? If you are, you're increasing the risk of heart attack and stroke by up to 50%. This is Dr. Tom Rosell, host of Dr. Tom Rosell Live Sundays at 12 noon. Why live with pain or the dangerous side effects of drugs when the doctors at the Rosell Center for Healing practicing 21st century integrative medicine can help you experience relief like never before? Simple, safe, chiropractic, acupuncture, and nutritional care can provide significant relief from arthritic pain in less than six weeks. More than 70% of our patients experience a return to life far beyond their expectations. Give yourself the best gift possible, freedom from arthritic pain, naturally. Call today to schedule an appointment. Call 703-698-7117 or visit online at rosellcare.com. Dr. Tom Roselle live right now on 105.9 FM and AM 630 WMAL. Welcome to Dr. Tom Roselle Live. This is Dr. Tom Roselle live in studio. It's cold outside. Winter sneaking around the corner. But nevertheless, we're here at WMAL waiting for your calls on any subject that you'd like to talk about. Perhaps you've had a problem. You've tried. You've applied. Come up with the same old, same old. Guess what? Absolutely nothing. Well, here we are. We're going to answer your questions, and we're going to tell you how to do it without drugs, without surgery, how to put the fire out, so to speak, so you can get better naturally. We actually have a topic, and the topic is one that, unfortunately, is very common, one that debilitates a lot of people, one that makes you say, ouch, more often than you should. And in studio, to help me talk about that, I have the one and only... Dr. Harlan Browning, the professor. We're going to talk about low back pain. Yes, we are. Good morning, Dr. Roselle. Good morning, Dr. Harlan. So low back pain is an interesting thing. It's something that virtually 80% of all Americans sooner or later are going to experience. And some of it is acute and transient, and it comes back later on. And some of it is chronic and debilitating and stays with you all the time. So let's get into the subject just a little bit because there's a lot of people that are going to have back pain. So they're going to carry Christmas trees. They're going to uh, shovel snow in a little while. They're going to pick up things that they shouldn't. Raking the leaves. They're raking the leaves, the grocery shopping, they're bringing in wood, all those things. They can cause back pain. Well, you know, the, statistically, the interesting thing is outside of the common cold, the second most common reason people go to a doctor is for low back pain. And um, looking over some data before we came up here today, uh, in 2008, 3.4 million people visited the ER for low back pain. That's almost 9,600 visits a day. That's ridiculous. So, I mean, it's, it is overwhelmingly um, something we see day in and day out. You know, exponentially in extrapolating from that, particularly in the light of healthcare systems changing coming up the first of the year, low back pain is one of those conditions that costs our society directly billions of dollars and indirectly compound that billions of dollars. Yeah, and, and most of it has to do with um, the surgical side, the, the, the back end of it, because um, it's extremely expensive to pay all the physicians, the hospitals, and then the rehabilitation on on uh, the front and the back end of, of the procedure, too. So it's, it's very expensive. Well, a typical surgical cost for low back pain surgery and rehabilitation today runs exponentially and up to what? Thirty, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars by the time it's all said and done. Yeah, and certainly could be more depending on how much hardware they put in their back, and if it's a, it's a fusion procedure and they're putting plates and screws. Each one of those things costs more and more money. A, a, a screw, a pedicle screw, what they put in to secure the, the hardware, you know, can run six to eight hundred dollars per screw. So it's expensive. I want to be part of that business. Yeah, uh, can we invest in it? Uh, w- you certainly could. I'm sure. That's probably a company we need to find out about. But you know, when you're dealing with these types of conditions, obviously surgery is the last last piece, the end, end result. And, you know, the unfortunate thing is that people say, well, I'm going to surgery for low back pain, and we see it way too often. Uh, when surgery is considered successful, you're talking about a 50% reduction uh, in the, 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 uh, the problem, or at least the, the problem is status quo, it's not progressing, it's not going to get worse. That's success. But failure is you are where you're at, and that's over 50% of the people. Right, and and the problem lies in in one thing. When we talk about back pain, we, we really should break it into two situations, something called mechanical low back pain, and that's what we all experience periodically. That's where my back hurts. And then we also have back pain that's associated with some sort of radicular or some sort of nerve 
sensation, in other words, the sciatica or the numbness and tingling in the leg. So when we see people getting uh, surgical procedures done for the, the mechanical low back pain, just the ache, it's it's a terrible procedure. It doesn't work. So outside of the folks that, that truly have a numb foot, um, you, you should probably not think about doing that surgical procedure until you've investigated other things. Well, you have three different types of presentations that come from the back. You have back pain by itself, you have back pain and leg pain, and you have leg pain all by itself. And all those things emanate from the low back. And in that progression, you have the ability of the body to respond. First, if you have low back pain, that has the greatest resolution. Low back pain and leg pain, a little less. Leg pain only, very difficult situation, particularly in the allopathic arena. But we see these types of things day in and day out. We're here at 888 That's 888 wmal I'd love to talk to you on any subject that you have in mind. Dr. Harlan Browning is in studio. We're talking about low back pain, and he will be your host, your presenter, this Wednesday evening at the Rizal Center for Healing. Our topic, obviously, low back pain. If you'd like to be part of that on the 28th, give us a call at 703-698-7117. That's 703-698-7117. Tell my staff that you'd like to attend Dr. Browning's presentation on low back pain. And this is an opportunity that if you've had ongoing back pain, you're on all kinds of medications, whether it's just uh, an NSAID, which is destroying all kinds of things in your body, we'll get into, and some of the steroids that they give you, and the Depomedrol injections and so forth. You've been through that nonsense, and your brain says, well, as long as I don't do this, I'm okay. Basically, you're giving up your life. This is an opportunity for you to try to figure out how you might be able to get your life back. So, 703-698-7117. Dr. Browning, let's talk a little bit about the you know the devastation of of this condition i mean people put up with low back pain they just kind of deal with it they think it's common they think it's well everybody has it well uh, you know i think it 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 happens that way because we hurt our back early on in life you know there's i, I see lots of young kids you know teenagers in the office all the time that have back pain so if we start to experience that problem at let's say 14 or 15 then by the time we become 30 we, we become desensitized to it so we expect it to happen so um, we don't necessarily take action on it because we take a few aspirin or we take an Advil two or three days we rest it ice it heat it whatever and we you know appear to, to bounce back only to re-injured again later on the the back presents pain for a lot of reasons you st- we started talking about it you mentioned that we have structural components but we also can have reflexive pain as well pain that goes to the back from the internal environment of the body the organ system certainly now we've talked about you know as the nerves come down they bifurcate one branch goes to organ one branch goes to muscle but they also share a lot of other things and one of the things that they share is the toxic waste removal system, as I like to call it, the lymphatic chain, the lymphatic system. And if we have, if we're eating garbage, if we're eating junk, then we reabsorb a lot of that toxin and waste into the soft tissue of our spines. And then that can cause the discs to swell and to be in a jeopardous situation. Right. And then in in, in applied kinesiology, one of the techniques that we utilize in the office, we we look closely at something called the ileocecal valve, which is uh, a valve that is at a transitional area between the small intestine and the large intestine, and, and the competency of that valve becomes extremely important if we don't want toxic materials, like you referenced, to reflux back in and be absorbed. And because our diets are usually heavily laden with, with sugars and sodas and, and refined foods and chemicals and all those things that would irritate the intestinal lining, uh, it becomes a problem. And the interesting thing is a digestive complaint isn't usually the first Thing that tells us that that valve is being involved. No, it's often back pain. Yeah, back pain or, or some sort of weird type of swelling or weird type of pain pattern that comes out of nowhere with with no excuse. It's a very sudden onset. It's, patients will come in and just simply say, you know, I don't know what happened. My back just, I, I didn't even move wrong. I, it's just I woke up with this horrible pain and I can't move at all. Right. And, and the body's response when we become toxic is to dilute it. That's really all we can do. We can either excrete it or we can dilute it. In, in the short term, it becomes easier to dilute it. And then if the body doesn't have the capacity to get rid of it, either through um, going to the bathroom, then we'll start to push it out of the skin, too. So the first thing we always do is retain water just to try to thin it down. Dr. Harlan Browning, my guest in studio. We're talking about low back pain. He'll be your presenter, your host, this Wednesday evening at the Rizal Center for Healing, Wednesday the 28th of this month, a couple days left. And he's going to be talking about all those things you need to know to get rid of your low back pain. So give us a call at 703-698-7117. Having said that, let's go to the phones. George, thank you for calling, sir. How can we help you? 
Hi, I was just listening to your actually your comments on lower back pain and things like that, and that people go actually go to surgeons, and the surgeon will actually perform a surgery on somebody's back that really might be questionable. Um, you know, my comment on that is, you know, I have a bad L5 and L6, the bulging discs. Um, I'm a I'm a large guy. I'm 270 pounds, six five. And you know the, the the strange thing about that is most all surgeons will never say uh, go to a chiropractor or go to the gym and get a trainer. I, I've never heard that. And when I was having chronic pain in my back, I, I I went to a dozen back surgeons. And you know the the last guy that I went to see works out of Reston Hospital, real good guy. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you have to alter your lifestyle. He says, you know, just change some things up. I mean, I lost 20 pounds. Uh, I still squat and I have bad, I have bulging discs. I still squat. I still work out. I still do everything. So, I mean, a lot of people seek the medical advice of a surgeon. And I think the first thing the surgeon wants to do is look at it and say, okay, well, you know, this is what we can do to alleviate your pain. And I, I don't, well, I don't the, really think that's the way to go. Well, the, prob the problem is, George, that if he's got a knife in his hands, everything looks like he should cut it. <laughs> and you know that's that's an unfortunate situation because most surgeries are failures they don't really resolve the the condition and when you have a low back problem there is a why is that there's only three things that cause anything there's either injury to the body that hasn't been dealt with effectively and totally there's biochemical imbalances we just talked a little bit about the ileocecal valve and then the third piece is emotional stress which can knock anything out in the body but when you have all three of those things working together you got a problem so when you go to someone who you know can write a prescription you know, he's going to give you a drug. If you have somebody that is going to cut, he's going to want to cut. There's very few guys, although there are some out there, who understand the, the relationship between the why and what really needs to be done to reverse things. There's very few cases, very few low back cases that I've seen in 36 years of practice that can't have very significant resolution of the problem. There are very few that need to go to surgery because the the disc itself has completely excluded, come out of the contents of the shell that holds it together, and it's an emergency it's an emergency surgery, even in cases of spinal stenosis causing low back pain. Well, what you say is so on, on spot. Uh, I really hope that people listen to you because, you know, I, I think a lot of people are looking for immediate relief, and, and I've I've been in the gym my whole life. I'm a gym rat. You know, I've seen people go in for surgery, come out and say, you know, I wish I'd have never done it. You know, it it's not a, an overnight thing when you go in to have surgery with these people. They no. think they're going to come out and everything's going to be fine. And it, I've seen it my whole life. Uh, yeah, it's... I'm 58 years old. It doesn't work. Well, I'll tell you what, George, you and I are in the same neighborhood age-wise. I'm a little older than you by a few years, and, you know, it's one of those things that I've had some major accidents, and I've ended up with tremendous back pain over the years. But structurally, I'm sound today because of manipulative care, because of acupuncture, because of nutrition, because I do work out, because I do the things that you do. So there's that resolution. George, we've got to go on. I appreciate your call. Thank you. Thank you for calling. We see this all the time. Yeah, and you know, I'd like to add, and this was, that was actually a perfect call for for, for what we're we're talking about, because if if a person does not have levels of impairment, in other words, the person is not developing weakness or is not developing loss of sensation, you have a quite a bit of time to turn that around. And what happens is, folks will go to. Uh, their surgeon, they'll, they'll get the MRI, and I can guarantee you, because the t statistics show it, that if you're over the age of 45, you're going to have some bulging discs in your back, and they might not be symptomatic. So it becomes very easy for someone to look at an MRI and say, look at this, this is, this looks terrible. But if, if the person does not also have the presentation of, the, of starting to develop the impairment, we can't be sure that what we're seeing on film is what's causing the pain that brought the person into no, the office. No, there, there, there are people that come in that have horrible, horrible spines on x-ray, but they're actually functionally at a very, very high level and, and doing very well. I mean, you know my history probably better than anybody else because you're one of the guys that treat me. And going back to the accident that I had when we were together in Las Vegas many years ago when I hit my head on that marble pillar and then the cascade of problems, including low back pain and sciatica and the development of stenosis, my problem didn't come from my low back. It came from my neck and the trauma that we had. And subsequently, my treatment is directed to treating and stabilizing my upper cervical area, my neck. And then when that everything's in cool, I don't have pain. I'm, I'm in a great place. My guest in studio, your host this Wednesday, 
Thursday evening at the Brazil Center for Healing, the 28th of the month. And he's going to be talking about low back pain. What else? And how you can get rid of the problem and how you can return to life at a much higher level. So give us a call at 703-698-7117. 703-698-7117. Before we forget, Tuesday night, we have something very special that's happening for our practice. WIDA, as we've been talking about, PBS, uh, local affiliate, is going to be airing a 90-minute documentary on our work, Ageless Health. It's phenomenal. It's over the top. Uh, we had the opportunity to watch it a couple weeks ago at the premiere event, and it is absolutely incredible. We've uh, In, uh, in the, uh, the Ageless Health uh, documentary, there is a fireman, who is cameoed, who had low back pain, and very serious low back pain, was going to have to quit. And he came into our office, and we found that there was a biochemical component to it because he had been everywhere, and we were able to restore his health fully. At the time, he'd been in, uh, I think he was uh, probably about 10 years, 11 years as a fireman in Fairfax County, and he just retired two years ago after 33 years. So that's significant. Yeah, it's, it's a great story, and it fits in perfectly about what we're talking about today. And, you know, to touch on ageless health, you know, the thing, the, the presentation I'm doing on Wednesday is really going to be kind of a continuation of, of the talk that I did for our seminar series at Ageless Health. This year? Um, yeah, this year. That's so right. if for anybody who's who was um, lucky enough to be there, this is going to bring a little bit more to the table because I'll have a little bit more time to, to, to go over it. Let's go to the phone. CJ, how can we help you? Hi. Um... I, uh, okay, I don't want to make this too long a story. I've had five spine surgeries total. Hello? Yes, sir. We can hear you. We're uh, listening. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I lost you for a second. Nope. Um, in the last two years, I've had two lower back surgeries. Um, I had the first of three lower back surgeries, L5, S1. Uh, uh, the first two were uh, uh, discectomies or, or laminectomies. Um the first one was back in 99. After that, I had a very uh, active uh, triathlon and endurance break, uh, endurance mountain bike racing. Um, wouldn't call it a career because I was a programmer, but I was on the verge of getting sponsorship uh, back in 2009. And the beginning of the 2010 season, um, I started having the ripping sciatic pain down the uh, down the right leg again, and so, let, let, know, me ask, let me ask you. Let me ask. Let me ask you a couple quick questions, and sure. you know, then you can ask me specifically what uh, what it is that you'd like to know. Uh, with your back pain, is the pain uh, worse when you're sitting for any long periods of time? Absolutely. Okay. So when you get up from a chair and you move around in the first stages, just for a little bit, does it make it easier for you? Uh, when I stand up uh, after sitting for any period of time at all, or a car ride, the coccyx is in. Tremendous amount of pain. I've had a full fusion L5S1. No, what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about is once you get up, even though that you're in pain, you can feel yeah, it. But you right. walk around for a minute or two, just walking. Does it does it begin to relieve the pain? Not very much. I'm pretty much living on Percocet, and it's been a year and a quarter since the uh, since the fusion was done, and I kind of plateaued at my recovery at a very low level of functionality. I cannot get out of bed uh, without taking medication in the morning and throwing the covers over my head for 45 minutes before okay. I can even go to the bathroom. One, one, other, one other question, and I think Dr. Brown is going to jump in as well. Uh, if I said to you, sugar, sodas, coffee, teas, fast food, fried foods, alcohol, gluten, additives, preservatives, how many of those are true for you? Uh, very low. As I said, I was, a, I was an athlete. I was a well, that doesn't mean anything. I still do. There's a lot of athletes that I know that eat like crap, and that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, no, whole foods, vegetables. Uh, my uh, my wife is big into the whole into uh, a lot of nutrients, essential oils, et cetera, et cetera. You know that kind of vein. Um, and uh, so I do tend to, you know, prep and cook all my foods. Okay, good. Uh, a lot of vegetables. Um, Hold me, fish. Uh, hey, hey, hey C- beef, more chicken, that kind of thing. Okay, let's. See. CJ, this, this is Dr. Brian. You said you had a, a L5 fusion. Yes, just L5. just just one level. Uh, yes. Okay. So one of the in- inherent problems of of multiple surgical procedures is 
not so much that the procedure didn't work, it's what the procedure causes, meaning, number one, you're going to develop scar tissue. So the techniques that they were using in the 90s are not nearly as sophisticated now. So they used to cut through a very important muscle called the multifidi, which is a tiny, tiny muscle in, in our back that we now come to realize has everything to do with the stability of, of what's going on. It's truly the core. So the first procedure probably breached that muscle. The second thing that happens is... When, when you cut through other tissue, including ligaments, it's going to form scar tissue, which takes up more room, and it doesn't have as good extensibility, so that limits our movement. And the third thing that we see is when we have a fusion, especially in the low back, not as much in the cervical spine, that fusion is going to make the levels above it and below it have to move more, so it speeds up their degeneration. That's why we're not seeing guys get their low backs fused nearly as much now as we did in the 80s and 90s. You know, the um, the uh, neurosurgeon who did the fusion uh, said it would be about a two and a half hour procedure. He was in over four hours. Uh, he said there was a tremendous amount of scar tissue. There, there you go. Uh, yeah, so that, was, uh, that's tell, know, that's telling you what happened. And he said he spent a lot of time doing cleanup and you know knowing that I was an athlete and wanted to yeah. return to athletics. C- CJ, the problem um, the problem that you have here is you've got a biomechanical condition that nobody has addressed. There's much more going on. There's muscle weakness. There's impairment. You have to remember that you have to look at all the components. There, even though that your diet is is uh, apparently better than most, there may be things that are in your diet that are not supportive to you. There may be things structurally that everybody is missing, and the rehabilitative process has not been directed properly for you. There may be things that are going on in your life stress-wise that are not holding uh, you together and allowing you to even deteriorate even further. Those are the kind of things that have to be looked at, and that's how we look at things. We'll probably touch upon it a little bit more as the program goes on today. The professor, as we call him, will be your host this Wednesday evening as he talks about low back pain in office at the Rizal Center for Healing. If you'd like to attend that presentation, all you got to do is call 703-698-7117. That's 703-698-7117. Low back pain, also known as lumbago, one of those things that affect way too many people, about 80% of the population, and it's the most common cause of job-related disability. Keeps you out of work, can't work, got low back pain, well... Just part of statistic. Unfortunately, you don't know the fix because there is a fix, and we're going to talk about that. And Dr. Browning is going to get into it very, very specifically in office this week. If you're suffering and you've been taking medications and your body doesn't work the way it's supposed to, this is an opportunity. Remember, there's three types of presentations that we talk about, and low back pain, low, low back pain with leg pain, and then leg pain all by itself, and it's kind of progression relative to its disability and, and dysfunction. So this Wednesday evening, 703-698-7117. Dr. Harlan, let's talk a little bit more about the causative things of uh, low back pain, what happens, how they're related, the more common situations that drive people into your practice? Uh, you know, I think you could put it in, in two categories. The acute low back uh, person, that's the you know, that's somebody who tries to pick up something heavy and their back goes out. And then we can certainly look at the chronic low back person. That's the one that says aching and complaints going on for long periods of time. Uh, usually they have similar components in that the, the person's experiencing pain and can only get into certain positions that makes it better. And they, you know, they do their their day-to-day uh, procedures to make it go away, like the heat and the ice. Uh, but when you really look at it, it's 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 typically the same type of situation. They've compressed nerves, they've they've traction tissue that doesn't like to be stretched, and they develop a lot of inflammation. You know, one of the interesting findings, and I read in uh, Journal Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics, and this goes back a while, that one of the predictors of a poor outcome with low back pain are people who smoke. Really. Yeah, and what the article was uh, saying is that it deprives the body generally across the board of oxygen. And because of that, uh, the tissue begins to break down, it degenerates faster, uh, higher levels of stenosis. And then you add that to other lifestyle aberrances, like, you know, sugar sodas, coffee, teas, that kind of garbage, which shifts the body to acidity. But it was very definitive. And the article was about cigarette smoking and the instance of low back pain, the instance of recovery. And also they talked about surgery. And there are many surgeons out there that will not do surgical intervention on a patient 
uh, with low back pain until they've had 30 days off of uh, cigarettes, nicotine of that, any kind. That's a, that's it's very interesting, and I wonder if it carries over also to just generalize to arthritis or degenerative pain. I would imagine. I would imagine because you know how many patients do we see that walk in and complain of low back pain? And you have this advanced degenerative uh, stuff that's sitting there. And as we said earlier, the degeneration really doesn't mean that they're going to have back pain or if it's, a pre- uh, it's predictable for low back pain. But in some of these situations, they are coexisting. But uh, arthritic pain by itself has a, a whole different presentation. So uh, I would think yes. Yeah, and, you know, it, to touch a little bit more on, on the presentation part, the one thing that's always amazed me when when we, we take x-rays and we look at them, very often I'll have x-rays of low, peop- low backs where the person has a tremendous amount of scoliosis but yet is not in that much pain. And then on the flip side, you'll have a person who's in excruciating pain, you'll take an x-ray and it'll look relatively good. So... The, the the amount of distortion, unfortunately, does not necessarily equate to the amount of pain. So we have to be very, uh, very slow with developing what, what we're going to do with the person because we don't want to stir up a hornet's nest because even though that, that curvature is there, it, it can be very stable. Yeah, the, if the curvature is present, it's been there for a long time, the, the adaptability that has been present is one that, as you said, if you put the last uh, straw on that camel's back, you may end up with something that the patient didn't experience before, and that pain could be ten times as as, uh, as bad as it was when they walked in the door. Let's go to the phones. Uh, Je- uh, Jeannie, Jenny? Jeannie. Jeannie, thank I'm you. I'm glad both of you were there. I'm one of those very healthy people that woke up in May with pain in the, the right buttocks area, and after... Going to a lot of different doctors, four diagnoses, an MRI, which looked pretty good. A neurosurgeon diagnosed coccidinia, or tailbone pain, sent me to a pain management doctor who's done three courses of injections that are very painful, and they don't work. No, they're not going to work because they're not going after the right thing. The problem that you're experiencing, when you, when you look at the tailbone itself, you have to realize that the nerves that go to the tailbone start someplace else. They come from the upper portion of the, you know, where the pain is. So the L5 disc space or the sacrum, uh, there's a whole bunch of nerves that come down that area, and it ends in something called the ganglia of impar. And uh, that just simply means it's like a transformer area for all these little fibers uh, coming off uh, the low back. And until you treat the low back, until you stabilize the pelvis, that pain's not going to go away. And also there are other things where the perineal area, the muscle that sits at the lower portion and holds the rectum and the uterus and so forth up, if it slightly begins to push down, it tents down, it's one of the primary causes of uh, tailbone pain. Because it's debilitating. It's so painful. I, I can't function normally anymore. I can only sit on ice. Jeannie, did, did you ever have a slip and fall? Even, no. See, there was no injury that I can tell you about. It just started in May. and Somebody even thought I had bone marrow cancer. Put me through all that. No, no it's not. Uh, uh, that's, that's not it. Now, this might sound like a, an odd question. Have you also seen an increase in, in headaches since this started? No. Okay. But, I have nothing else wrong with me but this, but this is enough. Okay. There, there's... Uh, part of our nervous system called the dura mater, which is more or less uh, a covering for the nervous system, has a very strong attachment to the coccyx. And, and very often what happens is because that dura mater or that sleeve that surrounds our spinal cord has to move a lot, mm-hmm. in certain situations what can happen is we can get too much tractioning of that. And, and unfortunately, because it attaches to the coccyx and it also attaches to inside of our skull, the end product can be either we develop this coccidinia or we might develop just spontaneous odd headaches. And it also attaches, uh, it, it comes out of the skull and it attaches the second vertebrae in your neck and then it goes all the way down, free floating, surrounding the cord and the spinal nerve roots. And then it attaches again at the, the first sacral tuberosity. What that means is that your sacral, your sacrum at the top is called the base. If you go about a uh, half an inch lower than that, that's called the first sacral tuberosity. And it attaches there. So if the pelvis moves, then it's going to traction this covering, this dura, and it can have a profound effect on the tailbone. We see it, unfortunately, all too often, and it's something that, once identified, can be treated very, very straightforward, very conservatively, without all the junk that you're going through. So, see, I've been feeling so helpless about this, and, and but I shouldn't feel helpless. No, not at all. 
if I could get to you, there are ways to treat this, and you know what to do. Yes, Jenny, do this. Why don't you come and come to the lecture on Wednesday evening, and we'll be there to talk to you. And then you'll listen to what uh, Dr. Browning has to say. But more importantly, we can have a one-on-one and tell you specifically what we would do in your particular situation. Oh, I thank you so much. You're welcome, Jenny. Thanks for your call. Thank Appreciate you. it. Bye. You, you know, in, in Jeannie's situation, she's a, a classic example of, of how we would integrate uh, the care in our office, because I th- I find that acupuncture is fantastic for the pain component of coccidinia. It does. While, while we're doing what we need to do to, to you know balance the pelvis, take the, the excessive amount of traction off of of that area, and certainly reduce all the the irritation. You know, I mentioned that perineal tenting and, and that muscle that makes up the pelvic floor, and so often that muscle will tent down. It's like a saucer; it's supposed to kind of tent up a little bit, but because of constipation, because of straining, because that we hold our breath when we sneeze because that we bend over and we pull on things that muscle pushes down instead of being held up and women also end up with uh, coincidentally with this type of thing they end up with urinary incontinence where they have to go all the time that they can't hold their urine again it goes back to that muscle and it goes back to neurological implications that we're dealing with this Wednesday evening the 28th Dr. Harlan Browning will be your host your presenter in office the professor will be there to answer your questions on low back pain if you'd like to attend 703 703- Six nine eight seven one one seven seven zero three six nine eight seven one one seven. Love to have you as our guest, and we also want to remind you: Tuesday night, eight o'clock. Put it on the map. Make sure you're sitting in front of the television. You're going to see the 90-minute documentary that Weta has uh, done on our work, Ageless Health. Love to have your comments next week. Once you see it, it's we think it's fantastic. We think it's over the top. Let's go back to the phones. Paula, how can we help you? Hello? Hi, Paula. Hi. Um, I wanted to tell you about an alternative method that has helped uh, work for me. You know, I don't, it just turned out I didn't have any uh, problems with the, with the disc, but I was getting a lot of pain. And a friend recommended going to someone who teaches the Alexander Technique. I don't know if you know any about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a posture technique. Yes. And it turns out that... What I was doing was um, I was slumping. Of course, a big part of the Alexander technique is uh, pushing yourself up. And then I was coming back with my neck, so pushing everything down. <laughs> so the base of my spine was hurting. As, as, um, part, as part of rehabilitation in our practice, we often incorporate uh, postural patterning. Uh, exercises that are very, very similar to the Alexander Technique, but we also refer out to practitioners who do Alexander Technique. You have to make a uh, a distinguishing diagnosis between a real structural pattern and patients who have just become uh, become maladaptive, if you will, to their environment. Right, and then Paul, you also have to consider in order for you to maintain that posture, there has to be muscles that are developing weakness and there has to be muscles that are developing shortness. So one of the, the things that we do in our office, and, and it's it's really the, the basis behind applied kinesiology is we look at posture before we do anything else. Because if we can understand why the person's posture is dysfunctional, we can develop a treatment protocol to help correct that and take the stress off those tissues that don't necessarily want to bear that weight. So when you look, go ahead, I'm sorry, Paula. Can I just say, warn people, it, it takes, at least for me, um, to understand the process, understand the te- technique. I worked with a lady for over two years. Yeah, it's... it's re- I don't have the pain that I <laughs> No, and it's it's excellent. It's an excellent, excellent postural corrective uh, exercise program, and it's been out for a lot of years. And you know, I don't know if you know the the history, but it goes back forever. And but it's been adapted uh, since uh, the there were books written out as far back as the the 30s out of the United Kingdom, and this process began to develop and catch hold and became part of a rehabilitative process in many of the professions, particularly in Europe before it came here to the United States. States. So it's it's excellent. I'm glad that it worked for you, and uh, appreciate your phone call. Triple eight six three zero nine six two five. That's triple eight six three zero W M A L. Love to talk to you. We're talking about low back pain. Dr. Harlan Browning is my guest in studio, your host and presenter this Wednesday evening at the Rizal Center for Healing. Love to have you there as our guest. All you need to do is call seven zero three six nine eight seven one one seven seven zero three six nine eight seven one one seven. Tell my staff that you'd like to be with us. These presentations are absolutely no cost to you, but we do require a reservation simply because we often have way too many people for our capacity. And we, by the way, the only time that you're going to hear about it is right here on Dr. Tom Rosell 
live. So love to have you, but give us a call, okay? Dr. Browning, let's talk a little bit more about treatment relative to low back pain. Now, we approach these things from a conservative nature. We try never to, you know, to utilize uh, anything that is drastically uh, intervening, and surgery is always, always the last resort. Uh, but where does, you know, how do we, how can you predict a good outcome relative to conservative care? We use manual manipulation and acupuncture and nutritional protocols and rehabilitative exercise and so forth. That's our approach, as well as a lot of the, the physiological therapeutics of laser and so forth and so on. You know, that's, that's a, that's a great question. I think if, if you look at, uh, predictors of, complication that people might come into the office with. And and I'm going to go back to what I called impairment before. When a person has demonstrable weakness in a leg that's also had pain in that leg for long periods of time, it's safe to assume that the nervous system is becoming so compromised that 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 appendage that that leg is starting to fail and certainly if we start to see atrophy that's an even bigger indicator that the the person's prognosis is not going to be as good the great part is most folks don't wait that long so con- conservative measures for the majority the overwhelming majority of people that I see and I know that you see in the office work extremely well and unless we're seeing the, the impairment there we have time and we just need to know what we need to do with that time and certainly put into places things that we can do for the person and, more importantly, things that the person can do for themselves at home as far as changing the way they sit, stand, lifestyle changes. You know, just as a side, one of the uh, the, the more common presentations, and, and not the majority of presentations, but very common uh, that I'm seeing more and more of today is low back pain and structural pain throughout the body because of the use of... Uh, cholesterol lowering medications. One of the side effects is muscle pain, and any area that you use more frequently is going to present that pain at a much higher level. We try to answer your questions and put you in the light of non drug, non surgical approach to healthcare and upping your wellness quotient as best we possibly can. Today we're talking about low back pain. My guest in studio, Dr. Harlan Browning, and your host this Wednesday evening, the 28th, at the Roselle Center for Healing. If you have any kind of chronic or acute low back problems and you'd like to find out if there's something else you can get done, this is an opportunity. Don't pass it up. This is our gift, our freebie to you. So 703-698-7117, 703-698-7117. Dr. Brown, i got a question for you. Sure. So here's the deal. We have, get a lot of patients that come in and, you know, they've been on all kinds of uh, pharmacopoeia interventions, you know, either an analgesic of some sort or muscle relaxant or a tranquilizer or plain old aspirin. And the problem is, and let's talk about aspirin, because or aspirin types of things, NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. If the doc uh, said, well, your low back pain is arthritis, they put them on Celebrex and so forth. There are significant side effects to these things sure. that people don't think actually exist, yeah, and, but they do. Yeah, and the problem, especially with, with aspirins and some of these other NSAIDs, is they actually disrupt what we call the basement membrane, which is the the mortar of our joints. So we know people who take c- glucosamine sulfate and chondroitin sulfate for arthritis. Well, th- that's the whole purpose about that is to maintain that basement membrane and the health of our joints. So what happens is when we take aspirins and other NSAIDs, it, it sabotages it and it actually makes the joints degenerate faster. You know, when you're dealing with an NSAID, and the increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Matter of fact, it's known that one of the interesting side effects of aspirin, of any NSAID, a lot of the things that people are taking, even the 81 milligram baby aspirin that they're taking, is long-term cardiovascular problems with the end product, unfortunately, with some people being cardiovascular failure, death. Sure. And we're not talking about something that only happens to one in a million people. This is a significant, I mean, all the labels have these warnings. Unfortunately, we don't pay the kind of attention to it that we should, and it's, it's uh, significant. Got a couple minutes left. Talk to us about what you're going to talk about Wednesday evening. Well, as you know, when, when I do my presentations, I, I like to, to, to go into the the why behind stuff. So I think it's important that we're going to sit and talk about all the things in our low back that can generate pain. We always hear about the disc, and I think the disc gets way too much PR because it doesn't cause as much pain as we would like to think. So we're going to talk about the other pain generators in the back. We're going to look at uh, what entails a good 
chiropractic visit or a good office visit? What things should take place as far as examinations? What additional procedures that um, that we may want to take as far as imaging or pictures or maybe even lab tests? And then we, we're going to talk about all the types of things that we can do conservatively, the ways that we, we can restore the spine, the ways that we can strengthen the musculature, the way that we can change the, the acidity, the alkalinity of the body and allow this person to heal. Finding out the cause, finding out the underlying why is that is critical in any type of problem that you go to a doctor for on for for any reason whatsoever. But more importantly, in and particularly in this uh, situation, low back pain is one of these nebulous things that kind of show up for some people out of nowhere. Sometimes chronicity, it's there forever, never seems to go away. No matter what you do, you have to alter your life, you have to shift, you know, your activities of daily living, if you will. But there's a way out. Generally, there's an identifying thing that can make life minimally a whole lot better, yeah. if not totally resolve the problem. Yeah, uh, and and the one thing that I, I tell all my my patients is, it's teamwork. So. Don't expect to just come see me and I'm going to fix the problem. They have to make the changes that we talk about. If they're not exercising, they got to get up and move around. If if they're just slouching around on the couch, they, they got to change that too. So we have to come up with a lifestyle change that they're going to carry forward. You need a partner. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, most people think that exercise is the remote control these days or the uh, the smartphones or the, the uh, iPads or in front of the computer, and that's what they get. They don't get anything else. They live their life vicariously through animation and not by getting out and doing the things that they need to get. We're here every Sunday, 12 noon, bringing you interesting information, if not provocative. And we want to remind you this Wednesday or this Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock, the PBS special, it's Channel 26, don't miss it, and the 28th. Dr. Harlan Browning, in office. Give us a call. We'd love to have you as our guest. Don't miss his presentation. He's always on top of his game. See you next week. Bye. Did you know that breast cancer is on the rise and that routine annual mammograms can increase radiation exposure to breast tissue 1,000 times over a chest X-ray? The result could increase the risk of developing breast cancer. Now, consider a simple, non-invasive, and totally safe adjunct medical procedure approved by the FDA, which can detect evidence of breast cancer five to eight years before it can be visualized on a mammogram. Infrared thermographic imaging can accurately detect initial signs of breast cancer, such as increased blood supply and metabolic rate, which is recorded as heat. Why expose yourself to radiation when accurate and safe medical detection is available? Call Thermography Centers at 888-485-7736. That's 888-485-7736. And for more information, visit thermographycenters.com. The Roselle Center for Healing is a proud supporter of breast cancer awareness and reminds you to conduct a monthly breast self-examination and include a thermographic breast scan as part of your annual wellness checkup.